The evolution of web engagement. That is the topic for this edition of CMS Connected. Hi, everybody. I'm Butch Stearns. And I'm Scott Lewer. And welcome to CMS Connected, the web content management industry's only news commentary show. We're coming to you from our new digs here in Norwood, Massachusetts, home offices of the Pulse Network. I'm Butch Stearns, Chief Customer Officer of the Pulse. Scott Lewer from Digital Clarity yes, Group. Sir. How are you doing, my friend? I'm good, sir. Very good day today. Good to have you here. Let's dive right into it. Wem. Web engagement management and the evolution of web engagement. What intrigues you about this topic? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I, I love that we're going to have a couple of guests on here to get different perspectives. You know, when we talk about an evolution of engagement, that means that we're maturing in some sense. So what does that mean? What does that mean for the audience and consumers that are out there? Uh, and what does that mean for businesses who are deploying these tactics? I think those are the questions that we want to kind of get to today. And we are going to get in that. As Scott mentioned, a couple of guests that will join us. Chris Nepp from Kentico is in studio with us and Deshay Watts from Sprout Content will be Skyping in. Also, in our Spotlight segment, our favorite, Sonny Lenarduzzi, will be Skyping in to look at Ektron during our Spotlight segment. But before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge our lead sponsors for CMS Connected. They are Falcon Software and Digital Clarity Group. Falcon Software, the people at Falcon Software can provide you with expert advice and integration solutions for all your creative web design, web content management, and e-commerce, social or mobile needs. And Digital Clarity Group, a research and advisory firm focused on navigating organizations through the digital transformation process. You're actually shepherding them into the future, <laughs> I like aren't that. you? I like that. Aren't shepherding you? I could them. see you with the big staff, with the and, staff the, and the staff right. and the and don't forget the robe thing. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to be one of your sheep, though. The gone now. I don't want to be one of your sheep. No, no. I don't want to be a sheep. No, you're but you have a lot you're of a wolf. You, you have a flock. Sheep. You do. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> and also a reminder to you, if you're frequent visitors to this program, CMS Connected, uh, and if you're watching the show live, look down below on our player page, and you can download the video white paper, Gleansters Selecting the Perfect CMS, been supplied to us by the good folks at eSpirit. And again, it's located right at the bottom of your screen. All right, without further ado, let's dive into our headline news segment. Are you ready? I am. All right, so we've got ECM, content marketing ROI, and IPOs up the yin-yang here, Scott, today. There are a lot of IPOs we're discussing today. We're not going to talk not about yin-yangs, yin -yang. but we are going to talk about HubSpot, and that is our first news story. Our good friends, uh, Brian Halligan and Dharmesh Shaw over at HubSpot, continue to do exciting things. And the announcement this month is a New England company joining Wayfair uh, as another looming big win for the Boston tech community, HubSpot filing to go public, looking to raise as much as $100 million dollars in their IPO. Uh, the eight-year-old company works with more than 11,500 customers, had revenues last year of over 77 million on 50% year-to-year growth. The growth held uh, about steady for the first six months of this year so far, with the company taking in 51.3 million, an increase of 46% year-to-year. Uh, HubSpot is not profitable like a lot of subscription companies when they look to go public. It lost $34.3 million last year and had a net loss of $17.7 million for the first six months, 2014. Significance of HubSpot's IPO to you. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, they, they don't have to be trailblazers here. They get to benefit by the fact that Marketo in the last year went public um, and blazed that trail for them. Now, Marketo's down a little bit, but I think HubSpot's got a lot of big kind of groundswell behind them. Um, this space is doing really well. I mean, Exact Target just had their, you know, this marketing automation space is really something that folks are looking at, marketers are looking to this um, to, as, a, as a big answer to, to, their, to their many problems and trying to communicate with, uh, with an audience and kind of do some of this content marketing and web engagement that we're going to be talking about. Yeah, and, and HubSpot's goal has always been to centralize different marketing automation tools yep. with SEO tools in a unified platform. But yep. when you look at it, you talk about the space. Yeah. Marketo's success, even though it's down a little bit, as you said, uh, HubSpot's success, it says that there's a need out there for it, and it says that the growth continues for companies that want to try to be the leaders in it, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it does, and indeed, and, and the difference is, is you know, a, a Marketo is that tends to be kind of a more larger enterprise platform. It's a bit more complex of a system, harder to use, big, bigger implementation time. A HubSpot was intentionally made uh, by Halligan and Shaw as kind of, you know, the people's product, that it's extremely easy to use, tends to be used by, by smaller customers, um, but but 
it is, it is a universal need that we're talking about here. It's not just large enterprises, it's medium-sized enterprises. It's everybody's needing to be able to communicate their, their, their information to their audience and be able to kind of have that good two-way conversation. We've talked a lot about the rumor of this IPO for a yeah, long yeah. time. So now that it's happening, yeah. your opinion, what's significant about it? What's uh, unique or surprising to you about it? The, the valuation, yeah. what, what, what is it? I, I think it's, you know, to, to be honest, I don't see any really big surprises here. I mean, everyone is, you know, I, I guess one point that I'd make is d don't worry about looking at the numbers. I think the, the financial analysts are still trying to figure out how to measure, frankly, I know industry analysts are still trying to figure out how to measure revenue and value revenue of these kind of subscription models versus the typical uh, uh, perpetual models. Um, so the fact that they have, you know, that, that, that they're not profitable today, I don't think is any indication of anything. When you're bringing on customers and it takes you a good 12 to 18 months to essentially break even on them, one would expect to not necessarily be profitable because they're bringing on, they're 50% year over year in mm. terms of their growth, right? Mm. So this is significant. So I, I don't think there's any bad thing. I think that, you know, they're going to get hit the 100 million. I think the only interesting stuff is I didn't realize how much the money that they had taken, that Halligan only has 5% of the company mm. and Shaw 9%. I think that's too bad for them. But, um, you know, I think they're, they're going to get their payday. Yeah, but that was their this strategy. Really that's good. how that they were going to build this. That was the model coming out of the gate, exactly. Right. They've really gotten out there. They've done a really great job in terms of growth. Um, and they're even expanding the product fairly significantly. This idea of being able to kind of... Um, allow marketers and salespeople to be able to kind of benefit from each other. They're shifting now into the, just in a beta version of their CR, uh, CRM system. So it's no longer just marketing automation, but it's now starting to be this kind of CRM information all about the customer, pass that over to sales and to be, to be able to um, kind of shorten that chasm a little bit. So narrow that chasm between sales and marketing to allow them to be able to kind of capitalize on that rich information you have on, on the online consumer. And Scott, in this story about HubSpot's IPO, you mentioned Marketo, of course. A yeah. uh, quick note for all of you out there, Inbound Marketing Summit, our event, we kick off day one of our two-day event with Marketo's John Miller and Brian Halligan from HubSpot kicking it off back-to-back -back on day one. There it is. There's their bios. There's Brian Halligan from HubSpot. And again, you can go to InboundMarketingSummit.com to learn more about our event. Scott, you have a busy week that week, but you're going to be part of the event Absolutely. as always. We're it excited is. to have you there. Um, I'm, I'm psyched to be there. Yeah, it is a busy week that week, but I'm yeah. really psyched to be there. I'm yeah, and to Hollis Thomas is from uh, yeah, your organization is going to be there. Hollis will be there um, talking. Uh, Kathy McKnight will be there. A few other folks will be there. So we're excited All right, uh, headlines here on CMS Connected. We move on to our second story, and it has to do with Sitecore. <laughs> Uh, and news that came out of Sitecore Symposium in Las Vegas earlier this month, and you were there, Scott, and the what? news comes out that uh, with about a 1,000 digital marketing vendors competing in an arms race, Sitecore CEO Michael uh, Seifert or Seifert? Seifert. Seifert um, started at the symposium. Well, I'm talking about it, but you were there, so I'll let you talk about it, about the chaos among vendors in content marketing. And his quote is, frankly, I think it's getting absurd he told people in Las Vegas, marketing technology is starting to fail the marketer. Each digital marketing tool is limited to the channel on which it operates. And at Sitecore Symposium, the big news was uh, that version 8 of Sitecore, uh, their unified platform that uses analytics to create a personalized cross-channel marketing machine um, yeah. with uh, automated testing, that news came out that they're moving to Sitecore 8 now. It, it, it did. Um, it did. And, and, you know, I think what, what, what Michael is talking about is, is, is he's right. You know, that, that you've got these, you know, we were just talking about, about HubSpot and the marketing automation systems that tend to kind of be performing more um, about email interactions with folks. And so you're considering email as one channel. Then you've got the CMSs of the world that are, tend to be focusing on the web channel. Um, and, then, and then you've got these kind of, uh, you know, the, the mobile channel. And you've got these numerous channels. And, and you've got the, the products that tend to kind of be focused on one channel or another. And what he's basically saying is that that marketers, truthfully so, are inundated with technology from all over the place and they're thinking too kind of channel specific because of the particular product and tool that they're in rather than thinking more holistically about the company. And as valid as that is, I think the challenge that he has is that, you know, even in the wave that we kind of beat up a couple of months ago, this digital experience delivery wave that, that, that um, Forrester put out, you know, they were trying to basically say this is all one thing, look at it all together and you can compare commerce systems and web systems and marketing automation systems and all that and look at them together. But I think the challenge is that even it was pointed out in that report is that many times 
customers, at least in the larger enterprises, are still, regardless of the suite approach by the vendors, they still tend to use one product for this, one product for this, one product for that. So even folks who have Sitecore and have embraced the model where they get, bring all this to the table, customers, I see them, buyers today, they love that idea, but then they still tend to use them for kind of one purpose. And so their idea is, we're going to really bring all this stuff together. The other vendors are posers. They've just tried to buy and then assemble. They're not really there yet. They're a few years away from having it all work really well together. I think he's right on that. Um, and our system is much more seamless for the marketer. Again, you were at Sitecore Symposium in Las Vegas. Uh, Seaford made a lot of bold claims. Yeah. One of them he made was that we expect Sitecore to be among the superpowers of digital marketing, right alongside Adobe and Oracle. Are they? Will they be? The question is how you judge what, what, what makes a superpower. I mean, I think when, when we, it's Well, you've got to be able to will yourself invisible. That's, it's, it, that's it, a given. It's unquestionable that when, um, you know, is a superpower defined by revenue? In which case, they're not going to ever be competing right. with, you know, right. an IBM or what. Or, you know, hasn't Larry it's, Ellison it's retired not. for the 18th right. time exactly. all of a sudden? Exactly. <laughs> um, but is a superpower one that you think of when you think of kind of where is innovation in this market, in this space? Okay. Unquestionably, they are okay. up there. Like, they are definitely named with the leaders. There is not a single quadrant or a way that you don't look at that you don't find Sitecore up and to the right. I mean, that's just how it is. They're doing really great work. I think they're, the, the payoff for them is they really have brought together fairly natively a suite of capabilities that folks want to use, be able to use together. I think the challenge that they face is not because their product doesn't work well together, it's because marketing organizations are siloed themselves. So the email marketer, they don't necessarily have to use the same tool as the guy who does the web stuff because they have a different job. So I use my tool and if I happen to, mm. so, so the fact that I make one user <coughs> interface, which by the way, they really did improve the user interface. It's much nicer now. I think it's going to be, it's, it's beautiful. Um, that's something that I think that they needed to fix for a while. But um, it, you know, it's, it's different people using this system, so they may use it in different ways. So it doesn't necessarily have to be completely seamless from one kind of person to role to the next. One thing that they talk about in eight, though, that I think is really interesting is this notion of machine learning. Um, a, a, a thorn that I think that, my, that Sitecore has had in their side for a while is that only a small percentage of their customers are kind of really using its full capabilities of this like full-on personalization stuff, um, a, a very small percentage. And, what they're, and I think part of that reason is because it's very difficult to do. It's very hard to go make the personalization work. This machine learning they're starting to do, the audience was a little bit kind of didn't know what to think about it because it was a lot to, to, to take in. But the implication of it is that now the system, rather than you having to go in and kind of score every single piece of content and do all this, it's much more now business intelligence sort of inside information about kind of how it can do it for you. It's more black box okay capabilities rather than having the marketer have to do all the tweaking of personalization. A, a final comment from this res respect with Sitecore 8 in particular, you know, it's all about, as they say, sending just the right ad to the right person at the right time. Yeah. A lot of this is futuristic stuff. So from an end user's perspective, are a lot of people just getting caught up with Sitecore 7 and now they're going to bypass it and go to 8? In other words, is it too much too fast for Sitecore? You know, I, I don't think so. I think the job of the vendor, um, it, you know, the job of the analyst is to try to pitch way out and say where they're supposed to be. The vendors are always ahead of the consumers and then, the, you know, and the buyers, and then the buyers are kind of picking it up. I don't think it's too far out because, you know, experiences and expectations are changing literally daily. I mean, whether or not um, businesses are using it today uh, and, and really doing this kind of, you know, personalization, right time, right place, right context, et cetera, um, for their customers or not, they are getting it somewhere else. So, it, you know, on Netflix, I'm going home and I'm getting that capability. I'm getting to watch what I want, where I want, when I want, all that sort of stuff. And so my expectations have changed, and so it's going to change. And so all of a sudden, it's going to be around the corner, and they're going to have to do it, or they're going to be behind. So You are watching CMS Connected here uh, from the Pulse Network Studios in Norwood, Massachusetts. I'm Butch Stearns. Scott Lever alongside. This is the web content management industry's only news commentary show. We're in our headline segment. Uh, we're talking today, our subject, about the evolution of web engagement. Our guests will be joining us shortly. Story number three in our headline segment has to do with enterprise content management um, and how they are, according to a story on CMS Wire, enterprises are failing to plan their ECM deployments. This is a subject we talk about often on this show, Scott, uh, that investments are being made in ECMs, but ECMs are not being used. They're being put on the shelves. Um, this is Kenneth Chin, Gartner Research Vice President for ECM, um, claiming, explaining that many enterprises have yet developed strategies around ECM deployment. How is it that companies are spending all this money, yet not 
Are they putting it on the shelf and not employing it? Why does this go on? Do you agree with it? That it happens? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it definitely happens all the time. I think that we just find ourselves, for whatever reason, businesses trick themselves into thinking that I can write a check and the bigger the check that I write, the more benefit that I'm gonna get in return for it and, 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 and get something back out of it. When in fact, so, so often, um, it's, it's actually not the case. You, it, the more money that you're spending on something, the more that's required from you in terms of planning, strategy, process change, insight, organizational change. I mean, all of this is really even that much more required when you're doing big, large system implementations, especially with something like ECM, which is essentially, the purpose of an ECM deployment is to help improve efficiency in the way that uh, that um, users, that kind of business users, employees work, how they save their information, how they can access their information, how the company can gain efficiencies and reuse out of information that's already there because knowledge workers today spend so much time looking for things, creating things, uh, redeveloping stuff that's already the company already has. And then as we talk about an aging workforce and wanting to basically take advantage of all the insight and capital uh, that, that's available to it, uh, knowledge, um, wanting to be able to capture that in some way. So, but all of that means that I have to really change the way that I do things. Right. And if I haven't figured out as an organization how to help my workers understand the benefits of working in some new way to be able to capture this, then they're not going to use it, and then it's going to fail, period. Well, again, this is Kenneth Chim, uh, Kenneth Chin, Gartner mm -hmm. Research Vice President of ECM. Be great if he's just talking about it and throwing out all these numbers, yeah. but he's actually got a 12-step process to a successful ECM deployment. Hats off to Kenneth Chin. <laughs> Do you have to have a sponsor to go through this 12-step process? He probably does, but more power probably. to him if he does. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think you should have a sponsor to go through a process like this. I think it's right, though. I mean, I think what he's basically saying is, so, you know, fear not, there is kind of a method. There is a way to kind of do this. And one of the first things that he talks about is just, where are you today? What's kind of, where are you in the maturity model? What are the implications of you moving from here to there? What are the processes that are going to be affected um, by, by this shift? Um, set, setting yourself some metrics to figure out if you're on track. I mean, all of these parts of the steps are, are just really, I mean, they're smart. They're frankly not that hard to figure out if you were to sit down and decide, hey, I'm going to go spend a whole bunch of money and I'm going to deploy a big, huge technology system. How should I make sure that it's successful? Um, but for whatever reasons, companies just don't ask themselves that question often enough. All right, we move on to news item number four on this edition of CMS Connected. And this one, I always ask Scott for the significance of a news item or this one, to go beyond the numbers. This one, we're just going to talk about the magnitude <laughs> of the numbers. We're talking about the web IPO heard round the world, both literally and figuratively. Alibaba is the largest IPO ever. We're talking about, as the writing of this story, a market capitalization in excess of $160 billion, uh, with their IPO, the largest IPO ever. Um, Alibaba is based China's e-commerce giant. Again, the numbers of this are staggering. That 160 billion market cap has now grown to 220 billion. 220 billion dollars. The stock price is at 90. Um, just insanity, right? This is this is this is insane. And I mean, this is what happens when you, you when you enter China. I mean, you know, China has. 80% of the world's mobile users. I mean, this is, you know, this is insane numbers of people here that we're talking about. So when they, I think they claim something like 200 and something million uh, users of, of, of the system, people who have bought from them. I mean, this is just staggering numbers that they have over there. And Alibaba is into everything. I mean, they have their own cloud, they have their own technology, they have their own payment systems, they have their own everything, which is the scare, by the way. I mean, the, the long-term investors are scared as hell of this, uh, scared to death of this stock uh, because of, you know, if you're trying to be in it for the long term, there's all sorts of things mm. that given you know, Chinese law that these guys don't have to actually answer to regulatory wise. Mm -hmm. um, so there's apparently some, they even put this out and notice that, that they don't have to necessarily adhere to some of the SEC uh, uh, um, testing and regulatory stuff and um, you know they get to kind of a number of the parts of the businesses they're going to keep separate and they're still privately owned they're not a part of this so but it doesn't really matter ultimately if you were in it to try to make some money on this you did pretty darn well because this is just staggering well let's again put this in perspective a little bit there was eBay 
-hmm. and there was Amazon, and now By there's way, eBay just split off PayPal today. I just, I just, I just heard about that. So eBay and PayPal are no longer okay. together, which is interesting, just because Alibaba has its own payment system. Yeah. It's very similar, kind of in this eBay world. I don't know what that, what the implication of that is, but it's interesting to see that happen. But again, here in the United States, mm -hmm. Alibaba is not as big a name as eBay or Amazon. No, but sure. Again, put the perspective. But let's compare them. Right. So Alibaba, two hundred twenty uh, billion dollar market cap. Uh, they have a sixty percent EBITDA, right? On, on. Uh, Amazon is negative EBITDA, so the, they have 30% net profit on, on, on their uh, money. I think they went up like 60% again this last year. So they're t we're talking about like $10 billion in sales or something like that, and of that 30% is net profit, um, whereas Amazon is in the red. I mean, just you know, th those, these numbers are just staggering comparatively. They don't even compare to an Amazon. There's a gazillion, a, a, an infinity number of Amazons within it, because if you figure their EBITDA is negative versus 60% on on an Alibaba. I mean, these, the numbers are crazy. They're By the way, you can find Alibaba's stock on the New York Stock Exchange. At Baba. Baba. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Baba. I'm from Georgia. We would have called it Bubba in Georgia. Yes, we would have. There was a movie made about that. We would have had shrimp involved with it somehow. <laughs> exactly. Also, time for our final news item story, and it leads us into our subject of today's show, the evolution of web engagement. And this story is about from Content Marketing World Conference that was held early this month in Cleveland. Julie Fleischer from Kraft Foods presented a keynote on content marketing ROI. And in her keynote, uh, she is the head of content, data, and media for Kraft and the winner of last year's Content Marketer of the Year Award. So she knows of what she speaks. Uh, she is the driver behind a shift that has happened within Kraft over the last few years. She described the content marketing program as a scaled learning engine to help the company understand its considerable audience as a whole, but more importantly, as individual Scott. And she says the hardest ROI <laughs> metric she revealed was that Kraft has proven that its content marketing yields four times better ROI than its traditional advertising. This ties in right to the heart of our subject today. It also ties into what we talk about a lot, the push versus the pull mentality, but something I know you feel strongly about, you agree with a lot of what um, Julie talks about here, but it's not an all or nothing it's not. I mean, thing for companies I, I, it, when it comes to push versus pull, traditional advertisers versus content marketing. The, the, the challenge I see with an article like this is that the headline gets all the attention and the details get no attention. People hear about and they read about content marketing um, and they go all of a sudden, okay, my pendulum needs to swing from what I'm doing over here to what I should be doing, which is some new content marketing. Because, oh, by the way, look at what phase. my competitors are doing. Because look at what my competitors are doing. When you look at the detail of what she talks about, they capture 22,000 attributes about their users, about, about pieces of data, different pieces of data um, that describe users based on their interactions with them over all these various uh, means of doing so, means of interacting on, uh, digitally. Um, and they use that to power everything from their programmatic ad buys to um, the, you know, the, the, the data and the content that they're pushing to users and, and, and what channels they prefer. And so their content marketing for them is a way of, it is, as we've talked about and as we've defined it before, I think actually Deshay, who's on a little bit later, helped us talk about content marketing once last year, which is it is about how can I understand as an organization, how can I put myself at the service of my customers, understand what it is that they're trying to do, what information they're trying to access, what feats they're trying to accomplish, and find ways to be able to help them through that, right? And then that way they'll look to me ultimately when it comes time I'm creating a, 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 an easier buying experience. But essentially it really is about putting yourself at service to them. And so therefore it is what are they, who are they? What are they trying to do? What information and content can they give to them at the right place at the right time? But it's not about let me stop all ad buys and shift to just writing blog posts. That's not what content marketing is about. It is how can I target my ad buys that much better so that the information that I give is that much more relevant to the person because I know who's going to be picking up on it. And then I offer them some value in the piece that I'm, give, that I'm pushing it out, out to them. All of this is, in fact, content marketing. What about the significance of Julie, the content marketer of the year, um, touting this and talking about how she and Kraft did an assessment, an internal audit, yeah. and figured this out for themselves? What impact does that have on the industry? I just think, you know, I, I think it's interesting when you think about Kraft 
you don't think about this kind of traditional online retailer. It's you know the Amazon story is an easy one. Yeah. It's an obvious retailer buy. It's you know right out there at the front right front of the you know tip of the spear. Um, you don't think of craft as like who 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 goes to craft website or who's interacting mm -hmm. with who are they targeting mm -hmm. and how and what, what ways and how creative they have to be to be able to go and create this engagement with their users, right? And to become that much of a valid. So one wouldn't think that the opportunity would be as would, would be there so much for them to be able to take advantage of this, but look at all the data they've captured and all the ways they can use that. So again, back to this notion of big data and that it's not just about <coughs> collecting it, but it's about how you use that regardless of the, the quantity and size of that. They've put it to really good use here and she talks about how they're still learning how to use that, how to, how to put that insight to use. But the point is they are very data-driven. They are very focused on who their audience is in whatever it is that they're doing. And I think the fact that craft is leading the way when it's not this kind of, if Target were leading the way, right. you'd go, duh, yeah. you should, right? right? But that craft foods is leading the way, I think, is, is interesting. interesting. Mm -hmm. Scott Lee, we're Butch Stearns. This is CMS Connected, the web content management industry's only news commentary show. We're going to take a quick break and hear from Kentico. And when we come back, we will be joined in studio by Chris Nepp from Kentico and Deshay Watts from Sprout Content will be Skyping in as we get into the meat of our subject of today's show on CMS Connected, the evolution of web engagement. So stick around, take a quick bathroom break, come right back. We're back with more. So you've got a great website. Your marketing team spends hours driving visitors to it and nurturing them into leads. And your sales team spends hours collecting, qualifying, organizing, and chasing those leads. Sales wants to focus on what they do best, selling. And marketing wants to get on with what they do best, creating innovative campaigns. But how do you make both teams happy? The solution is marketing automation. So you've got a great website with hundreds, maybe even thousands of visitors. That's great, but each one has their own background, interests, motivations and goals. But you are showing them all the same content. Not very clever. The solution is content personalization, allowing you to deliver the right message to the right person at the right time in the right form. So let's see how content personalization works. And welcome back to CMS Connected, the web content management industry's only news commentary show. The subject of today's show, the meat on the bone, if you will, is the evolution of web engagement. Time to bring in our special guest now, joining us in studio, Chris Nepp from Kentico. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm, great I'm to have you here. Why are you so excited about this subject? Well, it's, uh, it's the future. Right, I mean, we've I've been in the industry for so long, and we just the industry just keeps evolving time and time again. And this is just that next step. Is that you know, Scott, you talked about the personalization, you know, advertising, all those different pieces are really just where the marketplace is going. And if you're, if you're not keeping up with the future, if you're not doing it, you're going to fall behind. And and this is uh, what I'm talking to my customers on a daily basis about. Well, we thanks for having you here in studio from Kentico, and we're also welcoming in Deshay Watts from. Uh, uh, Sprout um, content. Deshay, how are you, my friend? I'm doing great. Good to hear from you guys. Yeah, great to have you here. So, uh, same question for you, Deshay. Why, why does this subject, the evolution of uh, web engagement, why, why does it fascinate you? Why are you so passionate about it? I, I think the one thing that I love the most about it is the fact that you can prove results and showing these exact funnels that you know a, a person comes to your website and then you're able to actually show that it turns into positive business results is amazing to me coming back coming from the old school background of PR when you used to have like a number of impressions that supposedly you know much more um, quantifiable well, great to have you here, Deshay. Uh, one other quick question. For people that don't know about you and Sprout Content, tell them about yourself a little bit. Sure. We, um, we started as a content marketing agency. This is our fifth year, so a big celebration for us at the end of the year. And um, through content marketing, we, we kind of have evolved into more of an inbound, inbound approach, and um, that really came from the need to prove results for our clients. So while content marketing is amazing and we love every aspect of it, at the end of the day, it's about proving the value of your efforts. And so we've kind of combined content marketing with inbound marketing for, um, for all of our clients. Great. 
Well, welcome to the show. We're glad to have you here, Deshay. So, Scott, you and Chris, let's talk about where we are yeah. when it comes to the evolution of web engagement. We've talked a lot about it on the show already, but where are we in that evolution? We still have a long way to go, don't we? Yeah, I think, you know, you made a point in the, in the last segment about um, when, when you were talking about uh, with, with Sitecore, are we, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> when you were talking about with Sitecore, <laughs> you know, is that stuff too far out? So I think where we are, it, the, the, the question is not kind of what are the capabilities of the industry and in some of the, pr in the products and capabilities that, 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 that uh, vendors like Kentico here are putting out, but also kind of where is the industry in terms of where are marketers typically? Yep. And I think there's a fairly big difference between those two. Um, you know, where, where are the capabilities of the industry is we actually do have the, the capacity to be able to capture in many cases a lot of data and insight about users, about what they're about what they're doing, about the decisions they're making. You can get some inferences kind of into why, um, and, and then be able to capitalize on that by communicating with them in these various channels. There is a, there yep. there are some abilities to have these fairly consistent mm -hmm. messaging from channel to channel and be able to understand kind of as a move as a uh, kind of buyer or as a consumer works through their various journeys uh, with, with an organization. But I, I wouldn't say that where we are collectively as, as marketers that we're necessarily benefiting from all of that as consumers ourselves because all these brands are deploying these tactics you know, perfectly yet. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. No, I, I agree, Scott. I, I think also what we have to look at uh, many times is the marketers themselves don't really know what to do. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they buy these tools. They buy a Kentico, a Sitecore, an Adobe, and they're, they're hit with all these different tools, the personalization, the email marketing, all these tools within one solution, and then they have to decide, well, who's going to do what? Mm -hmm. and so now we have this whole access to all this data. So we can personalize this content now. But, well, who's going to do that? Who's going to keep an eye on that? Because right. it's not a static uh, element. You know, we're continuously uh, evolving even our own web strategy to say, who are we marketing to now? How do we want to market to them? And what tools should we do? Mm -hmm. So when we look at then these, uh, you know, who's actually doing it, a lot of organizations are really kind of, you know, I do email marketing, you know, I do web content updates, IT does the, the overall daily, you know, maintenance of the, of the solution. Who's actually doing these different pieces? And, and that's, I think, where the struggle of the industry is right now. Yeah. So, Deshay, jump in here in the conversation, please. When we talk about the evolution of web management, where are we, in your opinion? Well, you know, I, in, in doing this segment, actually, I talked to a few people, and I think a lot of people don't even know what, what that means, the web management part. I mean, and it's more of defining, I, I'd like to take one step back and actually hear your thoughts on on um, what we're defining here. So um, customer management, customer engagement, you know, just going back a little bit and realizing that it's kind of a similar theme. We're just calling it something a little bit different. And I, I think that that's a, a first step is really at the end of the day, we want our customers, our clients to be engaged, whether that's on the web or whether that's walking in the store. So making sure that that engagement follows through with the, the different types of activities they're doing, the different ways they're finding you is, is really important. So I would, I would love to hear your definition of what this web engagement means to um, <laughs> That's a good question. So everybody. I, I'll, I'll take a stab at that, Deshae, if, if, if you don't mind. So yeah. um, you, you know, I think you're right. First of all, uh, I've said a number of times that I don't think you know, customers really want to be engaged with. I don't think they want to be engaged with your brand so much. You know, you, such and such brand, let's, not, let's stop tricking ourselves into thinking that I, as a consumer, have so much time to want to engage with the brands that I buy from. So we talk about that a lot, but let's just kind of put that on the table that I don't think that that's really that, that, that valid. I think the, but, but let's define what I think web engagement means. I think the, what we're talking about here, if somebody were to just jump into a conversation today and had no you know, experience from the past number of years in the way that we talked about it before, the evolution is that you know, for a long time we only talked about web content management and the focus was on it was on managing the content that I'm going to yep. surface eventually on the web. And it was how I, manage, how I manage that, can I do so easily, can I do it without IT, all of these ideas. Can I, as a marketer, be the one that can be able to manage this, et cetera. And then there was the marketing automation, then there was, there was a lot of these kind of disparate pieces. I can do email management, and it was about managing the emails. I can do social management, I can manage our social presence. And so it was much more kind of siloed in its, in its approach. The notion, I think, of web engagement, you correct me if I'm wrong, yep. you give me your thing, is, is, is this idea of rather than focusing on the disparate pieces, managing the content, managing the social, managing the emails, 
the notion of web engagement managers, let me help to manage the experience of my consumer. Let me, ex is, is that what, is that I, I what you would so. say? I think it's really a 360 degree view uh, of the consumer that's coming to your website. Which is another website. term that I hate, but yeah, go ahead. But, <laughs> but it's really, but from the time that they land on your website, yeah. you're collecting the data, what are they doing, who are they, and you continuously grab that data as they continuously engage you. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody comes to your website for the first time, you know, maybe they click on a couple links, they fill out a newsletter request, and then the next time they're clicking on a newsletter, they come back to your site, they maybe put a product in your shopping uh, in their shopping cart, but they don't really buy. It's really collecting all of this data over time. You're engaging them through this entire time, but then it's what do you do with that data? Uh, of really engaging them from time. If they bought something or if they didn't buy something, well, you have that data now. How are you engaging them moving forward? The next time they come back to your site, the next newsletter you send out, the advertisement that they're seeing on other sites, all of this is web engagement mm -hmm. and really taking all the data that you're collecting and then utilizing that data. As I was talking with Butch earlier, it's really about you know, instead of, like you said, the client doesn't necessarily want to be engaged with you, right? They, they may they say, well, you know, I, yeah, I, really, I might want to buy, but I'm not really sure. But it's leading them down the funnel that you want them to go down. They might not buy from you today, but hopefully down the future, and you're engaging them through that process. What they want is relevant information yep. um, when and how they want it. And I think, to say if it, if it, if it uh, makes sense to you, I'd propose that it's not certainly a technology, but rather it's, a, it's an approach, it's a process. But the idea, I think the, the, the notion of the evolution part of it is that we're not thinking about managing social, managing content, managing email as much as it is now. I'm thinking about managing the experience of the, of the customer that I'm trying to appeal to in whatever that means, whether that's in what I'm bringing into writing my content, into the information and attributes of data that I'm capturing about them, how I put that to use, how I'm engaging with them. So I, I think it's, to me, it's just the evolution is my evolution of my own thinking as a marketer about how I'm approaching the situation, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I like that a lot of, of more of a, you know, thinking about it from an approach mm -hmm. rather than the tools, because like you guys talked about earlier, there are so many tools available and who's going to manage all of it. And that is a whole different conversation, but just having looking at it from the fact that this is an individual person that's coming to my website to do something and let's figure out what that is and how we can give them the best experience. Yeah. I think I think that's I think that's really valid that uh, um, that shift alone the thinking about who the audience is and how can I speak to them I think was a big a really big hurdle if we think about ourselves just 5 or 6 years ago it was all about you know the metrics that we used to look at right it was all about this kind of inside out to outside in now now we're much more outside in and the the inside out idea was it was all about us the company how can we make our website you know within 3 clicks that somebody can get from that home page to yeah. where that was the metric can yeah. we get them there within 3 yeah. clicks can they figure out our hierarchy yeah. within 3 clicks to get there um, stickiness was the leading metric that we cared about. How yep. long did we keep yep. them and like yep. hold them? It was just this very defensive strategy yep. um, and much more about us than it was about them. So, so, so let's the stay on the strategy for a second. To, to both you, uh, Chris and Deshay, a digital first approach. I think companies are doing that, but how do you reinforce that? How do you do it cost effectively? Sure. How do you assess if you're taking a deep breath watching this show right now? Yeah. Am I really doing that? How, where, where do you go? How do you start with that? Yeah, I mean, it starts with what we were really talking about is the people and sort of understanding your customer. Um, and I think a lot of times uh, the clients that I work with are, are actually looking at the software first when many times they need to be looking inward first and saying, you know, uh, who are my customers? What do they look like? Uh, what is their buying behavior? So taking all of those different pieces and then using, utilizing the software at that point and then saying, how do we uh, uh, start to uh, approach that uh, from a website, from a marketing uh, content point of view, you know, the different avenues, the multi-channel avenues that we're going to approach. But it really starts with the marketer and defining who is our customer uh, and, and, and where do we put them in, in our organization. Deshay, your thoughts about that? No, I think that's definitely true, and I would just expand on that a bit and even go back further and, and ask, the, ask them, you know, what does success look like for you? We work with people all the time that they might not even know, you know, how much money they need to bring in from their site to make it successful, or is it money that they need? Is it more um, customers that they need? Is it more people on their e-newsletter that they need? Like, what, what are we really trying to do here and how are you going to prove the value of your of your efforts so tying together you know not it's not just as you were talking about it's not the definitely the the visitors that come um being able to track them track what they're doing tying that into your keyword rankings and submissions from the forms and the ratio of leads to um 
ratio of leads to sales is really the bottom line of what you're trying to get to. But how, if you don't know what that means, if you don't know what success means, then it's hard to even get started. And that, that we run into that a lot of, you know, yeah, we want all these things, but we're not really sure why and how that ties into the bigger picture of our company. Deshay Watts from Sprout Content is joining us here on this edition of CMS Connected. CMS Connected is the web content management industry's only news commentary show. Chris Nepp from Kentico is alongside. Scott Lear, uh, co-host here of CMS Connected. Um, Scott, go ahead. You wanted to comment on what Deshay had yeah, to say. You asked about digital first. Yeah. Um, and I just want to point out that so it, it's certainly fine here to all be talking kind of about, about marketing as the context. Yep. Um, but I think we should just... Just be mindful uh, that when we talk about digital first, that an or when an organization embraces that, it's not just about what data can we use and what information and insight can we use to kind of create richer digital experiences, but it's about how can we use digital throughout our organization to create better experiences for our customers, regardless of whether they happen to result in a new and improved digital experience, or it's a better check-in process at the hotel. Whatever it might be, it's, I think the digital first mentality is, how can we take this information and data uh, and insight that we have about not just prospects that marketers tend to deal with, but customers who are actual paying customers who have worked with us many times, they might, we might be a services business, how can we leverage that insight to improve their experiences and overall grow you know, across the board? And I think this, that's kind of the next probably phase yep. of what web engagement today is kind of the domain of the marketer. Um, but I think it needs to expand to be the domain of the name it, I'm not exactly sure what, <laughs> but it's the organization, somebody, um, and I, you know, I think marketers tend to kind of take the take on and they've kind of heralded the tip of the, the customer experience thing and they're kind of starting to try to carry that flag, but I think they look at it through their own marketing lens te te technically, you know, sure. typically. And, what and, do you think? And, and Scott, I think you're absolutely right. I think too is uh, many times when I'm talking with potential clients or, or customers that are starting to look down this road, what, what happens a lot of times is they get overwhelmed. You know, they, you know, right now it's, you know, whether it's a, a fairly simple website or, you know, maybe they're looking to expand some of their e-commerce functionality or their social, mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of times they start looking at the tools that are out there and everything that they need to do, and they get quite overwhelmed with the entire process. So, you know, what we usually recommend is, you know, working with one of our partners, you know, like a Deche, you know, Deche and her group at Sprout, or just, or if you're going to do it internally, take it as a step-by-step -step approach. You know, instead of you know trying to tackle everything at one time and, and, and taking on all these different projects, take it step by step. Break it down into smaller pieces. Once again, collecting the data. Most of our customers don't even know what kind of data they have. They might be collecting it, but they've never actually analyzed that data to say, who are our customers? What are they doing? You know, why do they want to buy from us or why are they not buying from us? So taking these, uh, these areas step by step to, to, to do a comprehensive digital strategy. Well, this is what to say what you talked about um, exactly, which was kind of even defining why you're in this in the yep. first place. What are you trying to do? This is we were just giving this council in the 12 step process two seconds ago when we were talking about ECM deployments yep. and why they fail. Um, what what is it that you're doing? So you're the one who's who's out there with customers day to day, and, and and this is why at Digital Clarity Group we focus so much on the service providers who are the folks that are kind of leading these folks through this you know changing of the process. What are the what are the challenges I think that 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 you find folks are calling you up and saying, just help us with our marketing. How do you even get them started if they haven't clearly defined some of those things? How do you work with them through that? Sure. No, that's a great question. Um, we, because this does happen quite often, we have a pretty in-depth discovery phase that we go through. And I'd be happy to, if anyone wants to reach out to me, I'd be happy to share the the questions that basically we ask them to consider. And it's everything from really telling us who their target market is, and often they don't even know that, so at least we'll know what we're starting with, um, to looking at the, the current traffic that's coming to their site, the current results that they're getting, are they blogging, how's their social media doing? And to your point, a lot of times they don't know the answer to that question, but it gets them thinking about you know what they're really trying to do here and so um like i said it's a it's it's about an we ask them about an hour to fill this out and we go through it with them if they if they want but um it really helps kind of paint a picture for where they are and and maybe in what they're where they're trying to get so that's that's how we get started with it so deshay and chris let's get a couple of final thoughts from you on a few things one is roe if you will return on engagement how do organizations know what's working, how do they measure success? I mean, clearly as consumers, 
there's the what and the when. You keep mentioning relevance, Scott. We, mm -hmm. as consumers now, we're so picky in what we're gonna watch, yeah. what we're gonna consume, because we want stuff that's relevant to us. And by the way, we want it when we need it. How are you measuring your return sure. on engagement? Well, I think Deshay uh, kind of mentioned it earlier. One of the things is they have to <clears throat> define success, right? And for every organization, it's very different. You know, if I'm a, uh, a higher education, you know, institute, you know, success for me is enrollment. Uh, you, know, has, you know, applications, enrollment, meeting with enrollment counselors. If I'm a, you know, B2C, am I getting more orders? So, you know, the social marketing for, for some organizations. So it really first all starts with what do we consider success? Is success, you know, it, for me, it could be very different than somebody else. So I think, as Deshay mentioned, I think the first thing you have to do is what is success for us? Where are we right now? And where do we want to go as far as there? Deshay? Yeah, that's, that's, I'm totally on board with that. And um, the where do we want to go, if, if people can tie it back into their overall business goals, you know, how much money do we want to, it comes down to money really at the end of the day, right? This marketing part from the marketer's perspective. And, you know, how much money do we need to make from our website and how are we going to do that? If we need to make $100,000 to afford an agency to, you know, to get us there, like we could pay an agency twenty five thousand dollars. There's specific formulas that you know that that you can use to work that out. But um, that's really the important part is looking at it from that first, and then we can back it up and figure out how to get there. That part, with all the tools available today, to be able to measure and watch what people are doing once they get to your site, um, that part's almost the easier part. <laughs> it's really figuring out you know what you're trying to achieve that kind of takes the most time. Yeah, I, I think that's super valid. I think especially in marketing, you know, you, you can't take your eye off the ultimate ball being, you know, whether it is customer satisfaction that you're trying to improve, and we were talking about customer experience before, or whether it is sales. Um, you know, if we just look at some, some metrics can be things that we just kind of, they can be red herrings, essentially. You can chase, you know, quantity of leads and sure. they're crappy leads. Yep. Right? Anybody can improve the, 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 a number of, of something. Ultimately, though, does that convert into more sales? Sales for yep. you? Does that cut into into better customer experience? So keeping you know on the kind of yeah. business metrics, not these kind of red herring marketing metrics, is really important. Yeah, it's the old well. Facebook so, like argument. Yeah, Why yeah, exactly? Why do yeah, I want a million likes? Yeah, yeah right. Does that get anywhere? Yep. Right. Right. All right. Well, uh, great stuff, Tisha. Thanks for your contributions to the program today. Uh, for people that want to reach out to you, uh, you can find you at Tisha D E C H Y on Twitter. How do you prefer they reach out to you? That's fine. Twitter's fine. Um, my email is Deshay at Sprout Content. Um, you can go to the site and submit a form that way too if you just want to contact directly. LinkedIn. I'm pretty accessible, so whatever is easiest for, for anyone, I'll be watching for any comments or feedback. And thanks for having me. Yeah, it, thanks, Deshay. It was great having you on the show. We appreciate your contributions. Right, thank you. Okay, uh, and Chris, we want to thank you for coming in for Kentico. And a reminder that you've got Kentico Connection coming up here in Boston we on do. November 4th. Um, and we're going to yeah. talk about that at the end of the show. Yeah. We're going to be coming to you live with CMS Connect from the show. We're excited about yeah, that. Yeah, it's actually November 10th and 11th. Oh, November 10th. What did I say? No, the 4th? Yeah, I'm no, sorry. No problem. So November, November, November 10th and 11th, you know, we're going to have, you know, from a technical discussions to marketing to real-life case studies, uh, really encourage anybody that's interested, just go to uh, connections.kentico.com and uh, register and find out more, see some of the speakers. It's, it's going to be a great time. You should really care a little bit more about this stuff, Yeah, Chris. I love it. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Chris Nepp from uh, Kentico, Scott Lever from Digital Clarity Group. You are watching CMS Connected, and we're about to go into our In the Spotlight segment uh, on CMS Connected now. And um, in our In the Spotlight segment, we are going to talk with uh, Sonny Lenarduzzi, as we have before, but we're going to be talking about Ektron. In today's episode of In the Spotlight segment, Ektron was founded in 1998 by current CEO Bill Rogers. It's a privately held software company based in Nashua, New Hampshire, right here in New England. Uh, Ektron provides web content management and digital experience management software to over 3,800 customers and 12,000 plus public facing websites worldwide. Their .NET platform is available through SaaS or on-premise. Uh, and again, this is our spotlight segment here on CMS Connected, and uh, we're going to be joined momentarily by Sonny Lenarduzzi, uh, who's going to join us. Scott, uh, before, as we wait for Sonny to join us, quick comments about Ektron and your thoughts about them. Yeah, I think they're an interesting place in their, in their evolution, Ektron is. I mean, they've, they've, they've got a new product. Um, sorry, the, you know, they've come out with a new version of the product. Um, the SaaS thing is a very new 
uh, new thing for them, which is, I think is which is great because the shift for them has to be um, as their their customers are changing. They tended to have initially four or five years ago they were smaller customers who could buy the product for a fairly low price. Nowadays the product has matured, the capabilities have matured, and therefore the price has increased. And so those same customers now um, are looking again through a bit of a new lens as they you know now have to upgrade themselves a number of times. It, they're 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 questioning you know should I make a whole new decision and should I open this up? And them creating a SaaS model, essentially a subscription based model makes that barrier to entry or to kind of to staying a customer much easier for those smaller customers. All right, so you drove into our new studios here today. It's an overcast day in New England. It what do you indeed. say we provide some sunshine ah, into CMS Connected as we, a little sunnier. as we always do in our spotlight yes. segment by bringing in Sonny Lenard Doozy. Sonny, I build you up so much you can do nothing but fail after we <laughs> the way we build you up for this show. Thanks for being on the show again, Sonny. Good to have you here. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, good to have you. Uh, let's talk about Extron. What, what's Extron's CMS platform all about? Well, I'll, I'll start with the basics, but I do have to agree what, we, what you were just saying. Uh, it's definitely true. There's definitely been an evolution with Ektron. Um, definitely interesting to watch. Um, but basically, it's an enterprise class web content management system platform. Um, and it manages content for organizations that are trying to use that content to present themselves on the web. Um, it's a customer experience and customer engagement platform. And really, with Ektron, content is king. So it provides tooling and tech to help companies use content to engage their audience on the web across all platforms and devices. Um, and as you were mentoring, mentioning, it's both a software and SaaS offering uh, for content management. Um, and services range from simple consultation um, and best practices to full-on training uh, and configuration and infrastructure support and end-to-end -end implementation services. Um, so lots to offer with Actron, and it's definitely at an interesting time right now. Some of the more unique features and benefits of Ektron's products and services, Sonny? Well, really exciting. Uh, last week at the Connections 2014 conference, uh, they just launched a new app. It's called the Ektron Content Marketing App. Uh, this is definitely going to be interesting to see how this evolves. But basically, it's Salesforce interfacing with customer relationship management and Ektron marketing automation systems. Um, so Exact Target does the outbound marketing, uh, and Ektron really focuses on the inbound. So it kind of allows marketers to really close that loop. Um, and it integrates content marketing strategies with the Salesforce exact Exact Target Marketing Cloud. Um, so you can set up inbound campaigns without having to rely on IT every time you want to launch a microsite or campaign. Um, outside of that, one of the de definite standouts for me is the Digital Experience Hub. So it provides pre-built connectors into leading enterprise applications to help marketers customize and personalize the site visitor's experience. Uh, strengths and then weaknesses, if you will, of the Ektron platform. Well, one of my favorite aspects about Ektron is that it has a philosophy of integration, which is a little bit different from the competition. So the reason why I like that integration philosophy is because rather than changing all the systems that a company may have in place already, um, for example, Salesforce, Google Analytics, SharePoint, et cetera, um, Ektron simply natively integrates it with them through the Digital Experience Hub. So that, for me, is definitely a strength. Uh, content versioning is also a pro. Um, it allows content to be separated from how it's presented. So whether it's web, print, mobile, um, it's all covered. And a completeness in the content marketing side of the platform. So it really gives users the ability to control uh, management and publishing flow in a really seamless way. Um, without compromising any flexibility at all. And the open platform instantly connects to any system to help marketers predict customer behavior and convert digital interactions into immediate results, which obviously is a huge bonus as well. Uh, end users, target market, who should be using this software from Ektron? So it's really suitable to mid-market to lower enterprise, I would say. Um, obviously, marketing professionals are the target market. Um, the trend has really shifted from those decisions being something that technical pros and IT departments would make to marketing professionals, which is exciting. Um, and marketers can really do the work themselves rather than turning to developers thanks to CMS. So um, Walmart is a customer, obviously, Sega, Xerox, Sydney Opera House. They have huge customers. Um, so really, I would say mid-market, lower enterprise is what they're aiming at. And Ektron's competition, who's their main competition? Sitecore. 100% it would be Sitecore. Um, and I would have to say Sitecore is slightly more flexible, but not quite as easy to implement as Ektron. So um, 
they definitely have some compar comparable features, um, but they both also bring different benefits to the table. And something that, I mean, it's all about perspective, but Ektron doesn't claim to be the best at all the bells and whistles. They really are best in breed at CMS. So that's what they focus on. And they have a really great um, network of partners that they work with to fill the niches where they don't feel like they want to be focusing on and taking focus away from what their core uh, mission is and what their core uh, value offering is. Um, EpiServer is a competition in Europe, I would say, and Drupal in the government sector but really at the end of the day on the high end site core is their main competition. Sonny Lenarduzzi in our spotlight segment reviewing Ektron today. Uh, Sonny, are we going to see you in Boston at Kentico Connection November 10th? I believe you are. I'm very oh, well, we're doing CMS Connected live from the show and, and uh, you know, there may be a co-host opening on the <laughs> show. I'd be glad to make room <laughs> on this set for you, Sonny, my friend. So I'm very excited about it. You're so. more than welcome. I don't know who will have to bump out because of that, but we'll figure that out, all right? I think awesome. the Sonny Scott duo would look Oh, so I'm getting bumped. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting I'm bumped. Thinking. Why don't we let Sonny choose? You know what? Maybe we'll <laughs> duel. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny, thanks for your time. We appreciate it as Thank always. You. Thank you. All right, we can stop with the chivalry now oh, while we fight boy, for her oh attention. Jeez, as everybody crazy. else does, she's fantastic. Um, uh, her thoughts about Ektron and your thoughts about it. Yeah, I'll add a couple of things. I think she really got to a differentiator at the end there. By the way, I'd say, you know, competitively wise, it's not just a site core. They, you know, they compete with an, uh, with a, you know, they are Ektron. They compete with Kentico daily. They compete with Telerik's Infinity a lot. Um, these are all other kind of .NET uh, full suite capabilities uh, that tend to compete with a site core as well. I'd say to you um, that the big differentiator that they have and why they're actually not completely comparable to those other ones is because of a point that Sunny made towards the end there where she talks about they focus on CMS. So very different than most, especially in the .NET space and especially in kind of the mid-market space, um, they've kind of taken this best of breed approach that basically says, we're gonna do CMS and helping to manage content and the experience of creating content. We're gonna improve that and allow the marketing automation vendors to do what they do. And that's why they are now, like they have the plugin and capability for you know, extending to exact target. Um, or you know, that we'll let the digital asset management vendors do what they do with digital assets and we'll be able to plug in and, and we'll bring our cape. So they talk about themselves as this digital marketing hub notion where content is kind of the center of, of, this, of this wheel and the hub of it and the spokes are all the different capabilities that an organization might want to be able to make use of. So whether it's marketing automation, um, whether it is social, whether it is CRM, et cetera, they view themselves as the hub. And I think that's an interesting approach where everyone else is out there, even the ones who were kind of formerly your best of breed uh, companies have now gone and created these suites, you know, a la Adobe and everybody else. They're acquiring and creating these suites. Ektron is pretty much stuck to their guns. And oh, by the way, they just took investment um, this in this past year from Excel KKR for an undisclosed amount um, that essentially really helps to, to boost their, their shift as they move into the cloud and they kind of shift to SaaS as they you know, need to kind of gear up on the marketing. We'll see, I think Excel ten, KKR tends to take kind of as private equity tends to do. They're not about necessarily an exit. They kind of have taken a couple of board seats. I think their board has really matured. They've changed over completely. Um, and one can take, you know, you can look at that through a negative lens or through a positive lens. But they've completely changed over their management team. Um, I like the, the new folks. I've met with them up in their offices in Nashua uh, in the past couple of months. I think they've got a good team on board. They've got a new, you know, new head of marketing, new head of channel, which is really important. Um, you know, Nate, uh, he, he's taken on their channel, which has been a struggle for them in the past. I think Ektron has lost some ground because specifically they used to focus a lot on the channel. Then they kind of uh, tend to sabotage the channel. Like they took a lot of deals and they were competing professional services wise with that. And then now they're back to embracing the channel, you know, quite a bit more and doing less services for themselves. So um, it's a big, it's a big time, big turnover change for the company. Um, but I like the new momentum. I like they've got the backing. I like to be able to be able to put the you know foot on the accelerator a little bit and I've always liked the product so I, I think it's you know interesting times for them you ready for rapid fire um, yes sir I am ready or not here ready it comes not, here it comes yes sir time for rapid fire on this edition of CMS connected this is where we put Scott on the clock with some of the top stories from around the industry so let's start with um, Vox media with an opportunity to create a niche for themselves 
in the CMS community. Vox Media uh, using a custom content management system called Chorus. Vox Media, publisher of online media sites like The Verge and Curbed, uh, using Chorus and coming out in a cop, uh, coy post on The Verge, Steel, uh, excuse me, Lockhart Steele, editorial director of uh, Vox, says, quote, that Chorus is the best thing going for the creation of digital brands. Also saying perhaps Chorus should become a tool for more than just those of us employed at Vox Media and a platform that transcends words in the way that Vox Media has long since transcended just being a collection of websites. Is there an opportunity for Vox Media in the CMS community to create a niche for itself here, Scott? You know, I, I actually, so I know nothing about this product, um, but I will say that I do think that there's an opportunity, not because of the product's capabilities, but because of the space and an opportunity in this market. Um, you know, we've worked with uh, you know a number of media publishing companies, and essentially they do have some. Every time we're approached, you know, whether it's financial services or 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 the or or, or life sciences or every industry tends to think that, and they do have some unique needs from a CMS perspective. You know, it's true that they do have some unique needs, but for the most part, they can kind of get away with the typical run-of-the-mill content management system. In this particular case, though, I do think that media has some very unique needs um, that tend to have to be tailored to them. This notion of really large files and data and managing lots and lots and lots of information like that. The notion for uptime and the capabilities required there. Um, so they have some very unique needs and qualified needs. And so if these guys have solved it, uh, then I think all the power to them that I think there would be an audience there. And I know of a number of folks who would want to look at that, at that application. Story number two on this edition of Rapid Fire on CMS Connected, it's now free. We're talking about Covio announcing they will now be offering a free edition of their popular search solution for Sitecore. This announcement being made to a cheering audience at Sitecore's North American Symposium. The free edition will help marketers harness the power of search to drive visitor engagement by enabling them to build and manage compelling search engines using their familiar Sitecore management console and tools. Scott, what does this mean for Sitecore customers and should customers switch from their current search environment over to Covio? Yeah, so Coveo um, has long time been a partner of, of Sitecore. Sorry, that was a little slight correction there. So, that's all right. So Thank Coveo, you. they've been a long time. Could have corrected uh, Sitecore. me right away, but that's okay. Uh, while you're doing your little monologue. Yes, you could have interrupted me. Now you're like interrupting Like I'm doing mine. you, right. Okay, so uh, Coveo has long time been a Sitecore partner. They've gone hand in hand, you know, oftentimes as customers have, you know, tend to look to that solution. I think this is really great, though. For a really long time, I've been wanting to, for search to make a more relevant impact on content here because I think search is really the way that users ultimately are experiencing you know, websites. They are getting there first, and they're, they're using search to get there. They're using search once, the, once they're there. And so this notion of being able to tailor experiences based on what I am seeking, what I'm searching for, it not only helps me have a better experience and have it be far more, it can drive my experience. It actually is used as a way, means to kind of drive um, the information and insight that I'm seeing. But I can also use search, if I'm, if I'm installing Coveo in this way, to actually be able to, to describe the content that I have so future users can benefit by it and I can make my, you know, my, I can change my relevancy models entirely. You want a few more seconds on I'll this give, one? Yeah, well, you know, you owe me about 10. Not that I really want them, Coveo. but... Coveo. Uh, Coveo. Coveo. <laughs> Story number three on this edition of Rapid Fire. Cloud first. Is this the latest example of the federal government overspending? Well, let's find out what Scott has to say about this one. According to IDC, the federal government will spend $118.3 million on public cloud solutions in um, 2014. That's 118 million on public cloud solutions. However, they will spend more than 1.7 billion on private cloud solutions. The increase in cloud usage is prompted in large part by a policy change that began in the federal government several years ago. The plan was designed to modernize federal IT systems on a number of fronts, including reducing the number of data centers and fixing or eliminating unsuccessful IT projects. As with the use of cloud technology in the private sector, the goal of transitioning to the cloud was to reduce costs and increase efficiency, agility, and innovation. Scott, is this really a step forward in reducing costs and increasing efficiency, or is this a Band-Aid solution by the federal government? I feel like this has been a theme of the show, this notion of the pendulum swinging from one end to the other, um, and words of caution against that, I think are you know apropos here. 
I, I never like it when, you know, especially in government, they come in and basically just say, here's the mandate, shift completely, give me a plan for how you're going to completely shift the pendulum from one to the other. I think there are good reasons to get into the cloud. I think generally, for government, though, I will say overall, this is a good thing, that they do need to modernize the infrastructure, that the reason that the infrastructure tends to get outdated is because they, they go by these big behemoth platforms that sit there, don't necessarily get upgraded, um, they come off the upgrade path because you can't find budget that particular year. You know, when you shift to the cloud, you tend to put things in from CapEx into OpEx. There's less kind of initial spend up front, but you become, it becomes a year over year subscription, but you're gonna stay current, you're gonna have the you know, most current versions of the software typically, and you stop spending money on things like managing data service. So overall, I agree with it. I just don't love the kind of forced pendulum swing. Our next story here on Rapid Fire on uh, CMS Connected has to do with reshaping UX or uh, experience design, re-examination of every aspect of uh, examination design. While data has always played a role in experience design, the digitization of customer experiences, both online and physical environments, has greatly expanded the depth and breadth of customer data that's available. As we all know, customer data no longer the exclusive domain of data analysts, according to a blog post on Forrester from Tony Costa. A new model has emerged where all employees have access to customer data and are empowered to use it. The result is a re-examination re of every aspect of experience design. So is it true, Scott, that companies that fail to adapt to these new dynamics will soon find themselves falling behind when it comes to experience design? I think that's absolutely the case. I think it's extremely relevant. Uh, in, and in fact, uh, Tim Walters, my colleague, has just written a couple of papers on this, one called Business 2020 um, and one about digital disruption. Um, so I, I definitely think that that is the case, that businesses need to be able to react to these new kind of paradigms that are changing. And it's not just the competitors. They're, they're competitors within their industry that are driving them um, per se. That's not necessarily where innovation is. But it is, again, in what the experiences that consumers expect. What he writes about in this article are kind of two things that are driving businesses and changing the nature of these days, um, both powered by data. One is that businesses are required to have high velocity, be able to make decisions and be able to um, change your organization swiftly, and data can be used as the underlying means of being able to do that, making new decisions about directions to go and pursue because of underlying data. Second um, is that this notion that customer segments go away. As you have more and more data, you can now be very individualistic. They give an example of Wells Fargo ATM completely changing per customer. I think it's a good example. But the point is, is that now that we have all this insight from every customer, no need to lump you into a big group anymore. All right, two more stories in this rapid fire segment on this edition of CMS Connected. The next one is titled Big Competition. I'm going to amend that title and call it Analytics Ping Pong between Sitecore and IBM. Or is it? That's the question for Scott. Salesforce. A Salesforce. That's Salesforce my second faux pas. It's is my it, second is it mistake. Only two? If we're it really is only counting. two. All right. Okay, Mr. Keep Perfect. Coveo. Uh, so as far as this story goes, IBM Scott just launching a new cloud computing big data analytics tool that could be big competition for another new not yet announced Salesforce product that does the same thing. The news of this is that um, recently Salesforce.com CEO Mark Benioff, is that how you pronounce his name, uh, leaked info over Twitter about the new analytic cloud product he plans to announce in October during the company's huge annual customer conference, Dreamforce in San Francisco. That's when they'll tell the world about Salesforce.com's analytics cloud. According to the leak, it will be likely be a product that takes the info stored about customers in Salesforce and lets you ask questions to find insights and make business predictions. Was this IBM with their announcement just trying to, you know, pull the rug out from under Salesforce? Um, you know, I think IBM is definitely reacting uh, to, I mean, in other words, sorry. IBM definitely cares about what Benioff is saying and doing, and no question that Salesforce is a huge disruptor to what IBM has got underway. But let's, let's just be really clear that IBM has far more sophisticated capabilities here. In fact, uh, Salesforce is actually using, using, planning to use Watson's capabilities to do all the power. So while Salesforce has access to an awful lot of data now about customers, and that's what it's really bringing to the fold here, through its CRM tools and through everything else in its stack that it owns now, Salesforce has an awful lot of information 
information and insight that it can have, and it's got all this data. But it's actually using IBM Watson's pow uh, you know, capabilities there to actually power some of the insights that it's going to be able to help you generate. So IBM is at the forefront of this, and it's more about Salesforce essentially trying to disrupt them. Um, no doubt, however, I think the big thing is that IBM is actually offering a freemium model where they're making so some of their capabilities in analytics available for free. And that, to me, says the power of Salesforce.com and how they want to basically be able to get out in front. Our final story in rapid fire has to do with Oracle. And really, you can't say Oracle without saying Larry Ellison. But will we continue to do that with the news now that um, Oracle shares off 3% on this news? Um, but that may be due to weaker than expected earnings. But the news that uh, Larry Ellison is stepping down, the founder of Oracle, as the company's CEO, and he's going to be replaced by two Oracle uh, executives, Safra Katz and Mark Hurd, who will be co-CEOs. Now, Ellison will become the executive chairman of Oracle's board, as well as the company's CTO. So while he's stepping down on one hand, Scott, he's really not going anywhere, is he? What does this mean for Oracle? Boy, what does it mean for Oracle? Well, I mean, I think their shares dipped like 3% on the news. I'm not exactly quite sure why. I think the notion of the two co-CEOs is pretty funny. And the, the I, I actually think this is a really big, um, it's yet another kind of PR stunt by, uh, by Ellison as he basically points out that, you know, it takes two men to do, well, a one, one work of one man and one woman to do the work uh, that I can do. Um, and But it was also interesting that they were both listed as CEO, not even actually listed as co-CEO. I think they were both listed as CEO, just happened to name two of them. And as you said, as he still continues to be chair, chairman of the board, and as he still is the CTO, he's definitely driving what's going on in this company. The question will be how long these two last, not only in existence with each other, but in existence with Ellison. I, I mean, there's presidents have come through this company one after the other after the other. So, uh, you know, we'll see how this whole kind of ecosystem of this trio of the three of them tends to work and operate. But um, it's interesting nonetheless. But the whole, you know, naming two to replace one, I think, is yet another Ellison stunt. Yeah, one final comment about that. So, you know, a CEO, by definition, one of their jobs is kind of to set the vision of the company. Exactly. So now you've got two people setting vision. They have been weaned through Oracle already, so they're part of it. Mm -hmm. Larry Ellison loves being in the spotlight, as we know. He's one of those successful people in the That's world. Right, but it's, so it's interesting to see this dynamic take yeah, place, isn't it? How, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. I, I, I don't know. We want to thank our guests on this edition of CMS Connected, Sonny Lenarduzzi. Yep. We want to thank Chris Nepp from Kentico, uh, Deshay Watts from Sprout Content. Did I forget anybody? No, that's it. How about Teddy Myers and Pat Leonard behind the glass Fantastic over there? Guys. Producers and, the studio, and associate producer of the show. Up and going. Was, yeah, and I want to thank you, Scott, Look for spending that. some time with See, me as always. I always so feel touched. better about myself when I spend I'm time so with you. And the next time we get to spend time together <laughs> is a Kentico Connection live with live. CMS Connected. First time we've ever done this, taking Although the show on the road. I watching from the sidelines, it sounds like. Well, once Sonny gets here, wouldn't you kick yourself uh, out? I would kick myself out. It might be better to watch <laughs> anyway. Uh, Kentico Connection is November 10th. Uh, here in Boston, and once again, we would also, uh, and also our event, IMS, the next two days. So it's Monday, November 10th, Kentico Connection, where we'll have CMS Connected Live, and then Tuesday and Wednesday, we will have IMS Boston right across town. Go to inboundmarketingsummit.com to find out more about our event. And again, we'll be, Scott and I, um, with Gary and everybody from Falcon Software and Digital Clarity Group, will be at Kentico Connection on Monday, November 10th. So thank you for being part of the show. And again, thanks to Falcon Software and Digital Clarity Group, our lead sponsors. We'll see you next time on CMS Connected. Get connected. Stay connected. On CMS Connected.